Well, hey there. Welcome to Farmington First Online. My name is Kerry Weaver, senior pastor, and I'm so glad you chose to worship with us today. Now, I don't know where you're joining us from, but we would love to connect with you. So whether you're on a phone or maybe on your computer, or maybe you've got this on the big TV in the living room, would you take just a moment and comment and say hello? And we'd love to connect with you further. If you've got 60 seconds, go to farmingtonfirst.com slash connect and fill out our online connect card. We would love to pray for you this week. But right now, we invite you to worship with us with our worship team from our auditorium here in Farmington, Arkansas. Shout it out, we're alive cause you're alive and what a love we found, death can't hold us down, we'll shout it out, we're alive cause you're alive and what a love we found, death can't hold us down, we'll shout it out. Your love is greater, your love is stronger serve a God who loves us, but God demonstrated His love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wherever you are, you sing with us this morning. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of His wind. And mercy, all of a sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed 
thy glory and i realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wet bamboo sea and all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affection are for me yeah he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us the grace in his eyes if grace is an ocean we are all sinking so when the meets earth like an unforeseen kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest and I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about great to be able to worship with you. Man, what a week. Um, Just seven days ago, we gathered here in the room and celebrated being completely debt-free for the first time in many years. And what an amazing day that was and an amazing celebration. And we're so glad that you were able to be a part of it if you were here with us or joined online. Uh, Since then, um, snow, right? Lots of it. And most of us have been shut down I hope you've been enjoying the time at home with your family. If you've got kiddos who've been home trying to learn virtually like ours have, that you've made the most of those moments. Uh, But it's been interesting. For us here at the church building on Tuesday uh, evening, we had two pipes in two different locations in the building 
freeze and burst, dumping thousands of gallons of water into the building, caving in ceilings, and really just causing an overall mess, which is one of the reasons, really the reason why we are exclusively online today. And so thank you for your flexibility in that. And special thank you to everyone who rallied and showed up with uh, vacuums and squeegees uh, to do everything they could to mitigate the damage while we waited on a crew to get here to do that professionally. And they were able to start at about 1030 on Tuesday night, cleaning up and extracting water from the building. And that process of us restoring all this will be uh, several weeks in the, in the making. So we just want to thank you in advance for your flexibility as we adjust to the reality of our building. But two weeks ago, we started a series called What Your World Needs Now. And specifically, we talked about the love of God. And in that first message, we talked about how the heart of every command of God is love. We began with this, that the group of Pharisees in Matthew 22 asked Jesus this question, Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? And so we spent our time considering what Jesus' answer to them was. And here's what he said. He said to him, this teacher of the religious law, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. And what an answer. He gives them the correct answer, but he also gives them more. More than they asked for and honestly, more than they wanted. They were trying to test him. They were hoping he would fail. But rather than just giving them the short answer, Jesus goes deeper. Here's the thing. Jesus always goes deeper. Think about it this way. Matthew chapter 5, he says these uh, series of you've heard it said statements. You've heard it said thou shalt not kill, but I tell you, don't have hate in your heart. He talks about murder and he talks about adultery and divorce. He talks about honesty. He talks about going the second mile. He said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you to love your enemy. And bless those who curse you. Jesus was always taking things to another level. And why does he do that? Well, because the heart of every command of God is love. And if that's true, and we believe scripture shows that it is, then it makes sense when Jesus says that all of the other laws and everything from the prophets depend on those two commands, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. If I can shoot straight with you, one of these uh, two commands is obvious. Obviously, God would command us to love him with all of our heart, soul, and mind. That one makes sense. This week I asked Sarah, which of these commands do you think is easier? And her answer was simply, well, the first one. It's easier to love God because he has shown his love to us. But when I try to love others, oftentimes they're unloving. That's hard. I think that's 1 John 4.10 again. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an intoning sacrifice for our sins. So it's obvious that we would be commanded to love God. It might even seem easier. But there's a reason that there is another command and there is even a reason why Jesus said that the first was in fact the greatest and most important. Because he follows it up by saying there's another one like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Five simple words. Should be simple, right? But it's not. It's complicated. And to be honest, for most of us, if we're honest, it's hard. That command to love your neighbor as yourself reveals so much within us when we struggle to do it. John Piper says this, the root of our sinfulness is the desire for our own happiness apart from God and apart from the happiness of others in God. Let me, let me read that again. The root of our sinfulness is the desire for our own happiness apart from God and apart from the happiness of others in God. Which makes the two commands being together make sense. But the second command exposes more than anything. 
You see, Jesus knows that within each of us is a natural self-love. Sometimes this is revealed as self-preservation, self-defense, self-promotion, self-fulfillment, sometimes even selfishness. It's what makes us want to pursue pleasure and minimize pain. It's natural. When something hurts, you want it to stop. That's natural. And part of that is because God has wired into each of us a love of self. It's why we want to pursue the things that make us feel good and avoid the things that make us feel bad. It's why when we're hungry, we look for satisfaction. We, we look for a meal. It's why we pursue dreams and try to accomplish great things and accumulate wealth and experience happiness. All of this is wired into us with this natural self-love. And so Jesus starts here because God created that within us, within us these desires that are in and of themselves not evil. We all have this. But another form of this self-love is pride. And pride is the twisted sense of self-love. That's this selfishness. That's where there's this desire for satisfaction, for happiness, for for fulfillment apart from God and apart from others. Pride is the pursuit of happiness anywhere but in the glory of God and the good of other people. It's the root of all sin. It was the root of the very first sin in the garden. You remember what the serpent told Eve? You won't die. You'll become like God. And she wanted that. Pride. Bam. Self-love. So Jesus starts with how he knows we tend to love ourselves and basically says, if I could paraphrase, you know how you love yourself so much? Love your neighbor like that too. Which means the way you want good food When you're hungry, want that for your neighbor. The nice clothes that you buy for yourself, seek those for your neighbor. A warm place to live for yourself, desire that for your neighbor. Safety for yourself, justice for yourself, friends for yourself, significance, success. The way you desire to be welcomed and loved and accepted, want that for your neighbor as well. Oh, so so I just need to want it for them. Done. Done. I want them to have all the good things. I want you to have all the good things. Well, what did Jesus actually say? He said, love your neighbor as yourself. Whatever effort you put in to your own self-seeking and self-love, love your neighbor like that, as yourself. You work to pursue these things for yourself, so you must work in the same way to pursue these things for your neighbor as well. Jesus gives us this visible, measurable way to know if we're loving our neighbor the way he wants us to. The same energy and creativity and ingenuity that you apply to your own self-love should be applied to the way you love your neighbor the way I love my neighbor. So in other words, use your self-love and your self-seeking as the metric. Whatever level that you are willing to pursue these things for yourself, mirror that in the way that you love your neighbor, those around you as yourself. But I don't care who you are, that's hard. Because it feels like Jesus is telling us not just to love others as ourself, but sometimes it feels like he's telling us to love them instead of loving ourselves. Like we have to sacrifice providing for ourselves so that we can provide for others. We fear that if we follow Jesus in this and really devote ourselves to pursuing the happiness of others, then our own desire for happiness will never be satisfied. And so we have this tension. You've probably felt that tension and lived in that tension. And so to that, I would tell you, there's a reason why the first command is first. There's a reason why the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind is the greatest and most important. There's a reason why the first one comes first. It's it's the first commandment that makes the second commandment doable. 
apart from the first commandment, you can't do the second commandment. It, the first commandment makes the second commandment doable and takes away the threat that the second commandment, trying to love my neighbor as myself, is really like the suicide of my own happiness. The first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And it's the basis of the second commandment. The second commandment is a visible expression of the first commandment, which means this. Before you make your own self-seeking and self-love the metric or the measure of your self-giving to others, make God the focus of your self-seeking. This is the point of the first commandment. The things that you desire most for yourself And that in getting them, you would feel like you are loving yourself. The things you want most, the things that will accomplish that can only be found in God. In other words, look to God to satisfy your needs, to satisfy your longing, to bring you fulfillment and joy and ultimate satisfaction. Focus all of that energy, all of the self-love energy, focus all of that energy on God. And when you do that, and when you obey the first command, when we love God like that, God satisfies and God supplies. So then I'm not threatened by the command to love others as I love myself because I'm not worried about going unsatisfied because I know that God is the source of all of that satisfaction. I have found my satisfaction in him alone. So now... If I've done number one, the first commandment, I am now free to love you not only as I love myself, but as God has loved me. I am now free to seek your good and your happiness and your even pleasure. I'm I'm, I'm free to love you as I love myself. And this This doesn't mean that everything gets easy and that there are no complexities in loving our neighbors. We all have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of resources. What should I give up? What should I keep? If my goal is to pursue the good of my neighbors, the good of my city, how do I really know what is good for them? These are tough questions. You're going to grapple with these things. But I'm going to tell you what. As you follow the Holy Spirit and as you truly desire to love your neighbors as you love yourself, God will make it clear the next steps for you. Because in spite of the difficulty of loving our neighbors as we love ourselves, love of God with heart and soul and mind sustains us and refreshes us and satisfies us. And when we do this imperfectly, when we when we mess up, when we pursue self-love more than the love of God or the love of neighbor, when we're selfish, we can remember that God's love is already on the table. His provision is already available and he welcomes us back home. Which is why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That is that desire to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And as you do that, you are now free and you experience the freedom to love your neighbor as yourself. No, it's not easy. But our love of neighbor is the visible expression of our love of God. And the more fully and completely we love God, the more we love him completely with our heart and soul and mind, the more we will naturally, sacrificially love our neighbors. We can't successfully obey these commands apart from each other. It's just not possible. So let me give you this. When, when I embrace wholehearted love of God, and make this your statement too, when I embrace wholehearted love of God, my life is released to love my neighbor as myself. The biggest reason why we fail to love our neighbors as ourselves is because we're too busy trying to get it for ourselves. And when we look to God as the source and the provision for all of that, it frees us up. It absolutely does. I'm gonna be honest with you. We see this so clearly in a marriage, in a marriage that's functioning the way God designed. 
in a marriage where there's mutual submission and mutual sacrifice and mutual love, where I don't have to worry about my needs being met because you're meeting my needs, which frees me up to meet your needs, which frees you up to meet my needs, which frees, you see how that works? It's the same way, except that in loving God with all my heart, soul, and mind, it frees me up to love my neighbor the way I love myself, the way God has loved me. And Jesus has made all of this possible through his life and through his death. In Christ, we receive God's love, which draws us more and more to wholehearted love of God. And apart from experiencing that love, that wholehearted love of God, we will waste our lives in the pursuit of that love elsewhere, in the pursuit of self-love. So today, Jesus invites you and me to respond to his invitation. Teacher, what's the, what's the greatest commandment? Well, that's easy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But there's a second that's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And everything that you know and believe about God depends on these two things. If you're a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, you probably look around you and you see needs and you probably often feel guilt for not doing what you should. Maybe you are living in this tension of what do I need to sacrifice personally to love my neighbor as myself? Let me invite you first, not to start there, but to start with embracing a wholehearted love of God, a a love that is with your heart and with your soul and with your mind, with all of who you are. Look to him to meet your needs. Look to him to satisfy your longings. And as you do, and as you experience that freedom, don't use that freedom for yourself. Use that freedom to love your neighbor as yourself. But maybe you're watching today. And to be honest with you, the invitation of Jesus that you need to respond to is the invitation to repent of trying to uh, achieve things on your own and to be loved on your own and to be righteous on your own. And the invitation you need to respond to is to repent of your sin and believe and trust in him. And if that's you today, I invite you to do that right where you are right now. Just to talk to God in prayer and acknowledge your sinfulness, um, your belief that Jesus Christ came and lived a perfect sinless life And in that life, he gave light to everyone who believes. And as you believe today, you repent of your sinful ways and you become a follower of him. And today you experience that love for the very first time. Whatever your response needs to be today, let's close our time together with prayer. Father, thank you for loving us and making that clear and sending Jesus for us. It's not that we loved you It's that you loved us and sent Jesus as a atoning sacrifice for our sins. So for anyone watching this video who has never believed today, Father, you invite them in to the family to turn from their sin, to turn to becoming a follower of you. And I pray that they will. And for those of us who are your children, who claim to follow you, I I pray that today we will embrace more fully a wholehearted love of you, God. And that in doing so, we will be freed to love our neighbor as ourselves. All for your glory, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for being a part of our worship service online today. I hope that this service was a blessing to you and your family. If we can help you or minister to you in any way, take a moment and give us a call or shoot us a text at 479-267-3159. We hope that you have a great week and that you have the opportunity to be a blessing to somebody else. We'll see you soon.